Well, good evening to everybody. Yeah, we are hot. It's good to see all of us here. And I've got a new guy, Paul, that's been in and out of the Hatchby a few times from what you said earlier. It's nice to have you here. And uh, hopefully we'll get a few more people walk in. But we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, everybody, please stand for these first couple <laughs> songs. Uh, we were just talking about living in high deserts. And this, uh, this next song, this first song is called Desert Song. And that uh, It doesn't matter if we're in good times or bad times. Kind of like the marriage vows. And, and for richer, for poor, for thicker, or thick, thick and thin, for, for better and for worse. That, that God's covenant for us is that he is there for us. It doesn't matter what we're going through, that he is there for us. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you bless us with. We thank you for an opportunity to worship you, to come into, into corporate praise and worship, to, to fellowship with each other, to, to love on each other, and to hear your word and to, to eat at your table. And we ask that you'd bless this time together, bless our worship, that you would enter this, this place with us, and that, that you would help us to, to learn who you are better and to draw closer to you tonight. In Jesus' holy, mighty name, amen. This is my prayer in the desert When all that's within me feels dry This is my prayer in my hunger and need My God is the God who provides This is my prayer in the fire In weakness or trial or pain there is a faith proved of more worth than gold so refine me lord through the flame i will bring praise i will bring praise no weapon formed against me shall remain i will rejoice i will declare god is my victory and he is here This is my prayer in the battle When triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ So firm on his promise I'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. All of my life, in every season, you are still God. I have a reason to sing, I have a reason to worship. I will bring praise, I will bring praise. No weapon formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and he is here. I will bring praise, I will bring praise, no weapon formed against me shall remain. 
I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is here. This is my prayer in the harvest, when favor and providence flow. I know I'm filled to be emptied again, the seed I've received I will sow. I've heard thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of love in the dead of night as you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm Never alone, you're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. I've seen many searching for answers far and wide but i know we're all searching for answers only you provide because you know just what we need before we say a word you're a good good father to you are it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, you are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us, love so undeniable. Can hardly speak peace so unexplainable. I, oh, I can hardly think as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still as you call me deeper still into love. Love, 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 you're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, and I'm loved by you. It's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am. You're a good, good father. It's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. To us. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways. You are perfect in all of your ways to us. 
You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your mercy and your grace and your kindness and how good you are to us. We thank you. We thank you. you guys, feel free to sit down if you want for a couple of songs. It won't, won't hurt my feelings if you're not sitting, but I will say the, the way this church likes to sit and stand, I'm not used to that. I grew up in more Pentecostal circles, and we didn't sit for music. <laughs> but, you know, every, everybody's got their own thing. So, um, Father, we thank you again for your blessings and your mercy, and we worship you and we love you. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow 
down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Spirit of Jesus, living within us, never to fail or forsake, unending promise, heaven inside us, whispers the sound of your name. Holy, holy is the Lord, worthy to be praised. Filled with your wonder, here I surrender, held in your mystery of grace, calling me closer, waking desire, coming alive in your name. Holy, holy is the Lord, worthy to be praised. Yahweh, fire rising in my soul, all-consuming flames, Yahweh. Holy, holy is the Lord, worthy to be praised, Yahweh. Fire rising in my soul, Consuming flame, Yahweh. He who was and is to come is the one who lives in us, the great I am. Yahweh, he who was and is to come, is the one who lives in us, the great I am. Yahweh, he who was and is to come, is the one who lives in us, the great I am, Yahweh. He who was and is to come, is the one who lives in us, the great I am, 
so righteous and true and just in so many ways. We thank you for coming into this place with us and to fellowship with us and loving us. Surely 
the presence of the Lord is in this place. Everybody please stand for this last song. Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love, my God. Comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in Shout to the Lord, all the earth let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the works of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have. 
you oh father we thank you and praise you and worship you for all that you are and all that you've done in our lives and that you are so good to us and kind to us and we worship you in jesus name and everybody take a break and let's have some fellowship oh man that was awesome with the casket and all the saints kind of standing out on the grass and very, very special. For our guest here, Toby was our um, pianist and uh, worship leader for 12 years, and he just recently entered into glory. So we did a celebration of life for him and, uh, you know, his whole family. You know, that's, that's something I think all of us as parents and maybe grandparents uh, long for and pray for, and that's something I've respected the most about Toby is all of his kids and his relationship with his kids and they were all, they all are Christians. And they're solid Christians serving within their churches. And, you know, there is no greater, greater joy, the Bible says, right, than we, that we know that our children are with the Lord also, that are, you know, in the family of God. And, you know, just them living so close together. I can go on and on. But Toby, you know, I always told him that. You know, I have the utmost respect for you just because of how even late in life you were still such a, such a critical component of your kids' lives and grandkids' lives. Very powerful because we just don't see that today. We don't see family uh, being important these days, and it's sad. And I think that's part of the, if you listen to me preach, you'll know that's one of my biggest uh, um, struggles, you know, and, and beliefs in the da- decay and downfall of this country. Uh, you can l- pick a billion different things that went wrong, but to me, the single most important underlying factor of the decay of this country is the family, the breakdown of the family, right, and the family unit. And, um, you know, so it's important for us as Christians. You know, we're going to look here in Numbers chapter uh, 32 and just this, this, this unity, right? I mean, God saved all of his people out of Egypt. He delivered all of Israel, right? The women, the children, the men, you know, the darker skinned guys, the lighter skinned guys, all of Israel was delivered. And what God did is he gave them a promise. And it was a national promise, you may say. It was for all of them that he was going to prepare this promised land for them to enter into. And what we're going to see here today, though, is that it takes that whole group. God wanted that whole group working together. They all had a purpose Remember, we went through the, the, the different tribes and the position of the tribes around the tabernacle, and they all had different duties that, that they served, you know, alongside each other for this greater purpose of glorifying God and magnifying God. And so anytime one of those pieces of that puzzle breaks down or falls away, it affects the continuity. It affects the unity of that nation and the promise that God gave collectively to all of them to enter in. Enter into the promises of God or into the land. Here in this chapter, them entering into a 400-year-old promise that God promised them the promised land. But yet we find these two tribes unwilling to enter in because they were content uh, with the land that was outside of the promised land. Uh, And God became angry yet again, right? Because they did the same thing their fathers did 38 years earlier when they were taken to the edge of the promised land and they sent the spies in and 10 of them came back with, this, with the unfavorable rep- report, uh, which you may say they brought about discouragement amongst the people. They said, yeah, God's promises are true. We saw it. The land is beautiful. It's flowing with milk and honey, but... But there's giants in the land, right? We're like grasshoppers compared to these people. Yeah, God said it, but I, you know, I don't know if God's going to be able to do it. So because of their lack of faith, they begin to stir up the rest of the people and discourage the rest of the people to where then the whole congregation said, you know what, we're not going in, right? What a sad, sad thing, you know, when people stop short of the promises of God. When people stop short of the great blessing and the life that is rich and full uh, in Christ that we can experience, you know, and and it's everyone's prerogative, you know, it's it's sad to see somebody just letting the gifts and talents that God has given them fall by the wayside, 
or not glorify God and, and use them within the body to edify the whole body. And they begin to do what? They begin to just spit and sputter. And you know, you can't make other Christians get on fire for the Lord, right? And, and desire more for the Lord. It's just kind of each of our individual choices, right? We take the word. We all read the same word. We all are filled with the same spirit, you know, and God has called us all to do different tasks. Uh, but those who want to really go holy in is what the Bible calls it, fully in, uh, and receive these promises and these blessings and see God move and work. But you can't force that on somebody else. Everyone has their own choice to make. But I will say this, as long as you make that choice by yourself, you make your bed, you lie in it. But as we're going to see here, when you begin to be discouraged and then you use your life as a platform and you begin to um, uh, throw your spiel upon other people and you start discouraging other people, you're actually being used of the enemy of discouragement to discourage other people. And this is where Moses puts his foot down and says, look, it's your own choice if you want to stop short of the promises of God, and you don't want to live for God holy, and you don't want to, that's your prerogative. But when you begin to uh, entice and seduce other people into your discouragement, that's where Moses had a problem, right? And where Moses lays down basically the law. You want to make your own bed, that's fine, but don't begin to um, discourage the people around you. In fact, the Bible calls that right here great sin, it's great sin uh, when we try to encourage people into or discourage people um, away from the promises of God, the life of God, trusting God. And so let's pray here tonight and we'll start with uh, really the end of chapter 31 that I didn't complete, but it, it'll go quick and then we'll get into uh, chapter 32. Father in heaven, I just thank you and God for this night and Thank you for this place, Lord, that we're able to come out of the elements and away from the flies and the creepy crawly things and sit comfortably and uh, listen to worship God through uh, a PA system and, and technology and being able to record services so people can watch from home or while they're driving to work. And uh, just what a blessing it is, God, to have this little piece of land here in Tehachapi where we can Declare it to be your land and, and your place where uh, your will will be done, God. Where we can stand firm against the schemes of the devil and against the world, Lord. And we can declare this place holy, God. And why? Because we are holy, Lord. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are robed in your righteousness. Lord, we are set apart. We are set apart for your purposes and your use and I just pray, God, that as we draw near to you, that you would then draw near to us and you would give us a deeper hunger and desire, that you would stir it within us, God, uh, to uh, seek and to know you more day by day, uh, that we don't find ourselves coming to the place where our past is a greater testimony than our future. To me, it's an indication that we're backsliding. If our better days as a Christian are behind us, than they are today, well, then we're backsliding. Uh, our relationship with you should be more rich. It should be deeper each day by day as we're growing and maturing and coming to the fullness of Christ that lives in us. And so, Father, uh, watch over us, God, and, and anoint us. Lord, fill us with your Spirit, and Lord, just continue to conform us day by day sometimes hour by hour, into your image and your likeness. Forgive us, God, when we fall short. We all do. When we fail, when we uh, let you down, God, when we begin to walk in the flesh and not in the Spirit, and we begin to satisfy the desires of the flesh, Father. Lord, let our repentance be swift and quick, and may we turn back to you, Father, and may you restore the peace and the joy of our salvation. And so bless all that goes on here tonight. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm just going to read here. If last week we ended in chapter 31 at verse 25. And I'm just going to read. Remember, this was after uh, the slaughter of Midian, when God took his vengeance by using the nation of Israel as a tool of his vengeance. 
uh, to go and to take vengeance back on Midian. So there was this great slaughter of all of Midian. Now, all of the spoil of Midian is now going to be Israel's. So this conclusion of the chapter is God just basically divvying up all the spoil of war amongst his people. And it's interesting here, you know, the theme tonight is kind of this, this picture of unity. Because not only did God want all of Israel to inherit this promise, but along the way, as they were conquering these different people, notice that all of the booty that was taken from these other people, um, it didn't all go just to those who were the warriors. You know, in, traditionally, you know, in the barbaric, <laughs> barbaric days, you know, when people conquered another nation, a lot of times it was the military. These guys would be thieves and robbers, and they would, you know, I even see stories of, like, in Vietnam, you know, which was a brutal war. Don't get me wrong. Any war is brutal. Uh, but there was some very, and there always is, some very dark things that go on, you know, in that land. You know, when you begin to take their spoil and take their booties, you know, and, and dead bodies, and you're looking through their pockets trying to take their money and their gold and disgusting things. Well, God isn't for that, right? God here is going to have them collect all this booty. God was against pirates, right? If you like pirates, God isn't in the whole pirate thing and, you know, taking your booty and, and, and all of that. No, God says, we're going to read it. He says, look, all of our commanders, all of our men are accounted for and everything in the land uh, that they came into possession of is all right here, right? It's all accounted for. Nobody, you know, smuggled out, you know, a hundred sheep, you know, when no one was looking. Um, so God was all about, though, sharing this booty. The men that went out and fought and maybe suffered and lost an arm and this and that, well, yeah, they'd get compensated, but so did the guy who was, you know, sitting back in his land, you know, with his farm and this and that. The whole nation uh, was able to divvy up all of this booty, right? And that's how God would have it. So let's read here, verse 25. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You and Eleazar the priest and the heads of the fathers of the households of the congregation take a count of the booty that was captured both of the man and of the animal, and divide the booty between, here you go, the warriors who went out to battle and all the congregation. Uh, levy a tax for the Lord from the men of war who went out to battle, one in five hundred of the persons and of the cattle and of the donkey and of the sheep. Take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest as an offering to the Lord. From the sons of Israel's half, you shall take one drawn out of every fifty of the persons of cattle, of the donkeys, and of the sheep, from all of the animals, and give them to the Levites who keep charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. Moses and Eleazar, the priests, did just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now the booty that remained from the spoil which the men of war had plundered was 675,000 sheep, 72,000 cattle and 61,000 donkeys and of human beings of the women who had not known a man intimately and the persons were 32,000. The half, the portion of those who went out to war was as follows. The number of sheep, 337,500 and the Lord's levy of the sheep was 675 and the cattle were 36,000 from which the Lord's levy was 72, and the donkeys were 30,500, from which the Lord's levy was 61. And the human beings were 16,000, from whom the Lord's levy was 32 persons. Moses gave the levy which the Lord's offering to Eleazar the priest, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. As for the sons of Israel's half, which Moses separated from the men who had gone to war, now the congregation's half was 337,500 and 36,000 cattle and 30,500 donkeys, and the human beings were 16,000. And from the sons of Israel's half, Moses took one drawn out of every 50, both of men and of animals, and gave them to the Levites, who kept charge of the tabernacle of the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then, here you go, 
the officers who were over the thousands of the army, the captains of the thousands and the captains of the hundreds, approached Moses. And they said to Moses, Your servants have taken a census of men of war who are in our charge, and no man of us is missing. Wow, fascinating, right? Nobody uh, died in that battle. Nobody was missing. They're all accounted for. Verse 50, So we have brought as an offering to the Lord what each man found, articles of gold, uh, armlets and bracelets and signet rings and earrings and necklaces to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. Moses and Eleazar, the priests, took the gold from them, all kinds of wrought articles, all of the gold of the offerings which they offered up to the Lord from the captains of the thousands and the captains of the hundreds was 16,750 shekels. The men of war had taken booty, every man for himself. So Moses and Eleazar, the priests, took the gold from the captains of the thousands and of the hundreds and brought it to the tent of meeting as a memorial for the sons of Israel before the Lord. So not only was every man accounted for, but everything that they found right through the war. It just said earrings and necklaces and all these things were to be brought and they were to then be divvied up. So again, God isn't in this whole looting thing or pirates, right? God said, I have taken my vengeance on these people, right? And so if God takes the vengeance and God gives you victory in the war, then really it all belongs to God, doesn't it? And so God just says, hey, look, I'm going to share this booty with you. And here's how you divvy it up. And see, it goes to the whole point that, you know, I was kind of talking about how God is all about community, right? God is all about, especially us as Christians, we're part of the church, right? The Bible calls the church the body of Christ, right? Paul even says in uh, 1 Corinthians you know, about us being in a body, that there's many different members of the body. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 12, first of all, in verse 11, he says, But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually, just as he wills. Now, he's talking about the gifts, the spiritual gifts, right, that God distributes to People who are Christians, who are born-again Christians, who are a part of the body of Christ, that the Holy Spirit gives gifts to us. And notice it says here that he gives all these gifts. It's the Spirit who gives them, and he's the one who distributes them to each one as the Spirit wills, not so much as we will. Uh, we can pray for gifts and these sorts of things, prophecy and you know a teacher or service or you know, there's a variety of gifts. You can read all about the gifts there in chapter 12 and also Romans chapter 12. So it's good to pray for those gifts and desire those gifts. But when God gives you the gift, it's the gift that the Spirit wills. And the Spirit is the one that gives you these gifts. But read on because it says here, verse 12, he says, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all members of the body, though they are many, are one body so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. I love this. Look at verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. If a whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But God now, uh, but now God has placed, I love this, the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. You see, sometimes we forget that, right? When we're church hopping, right? Or we're, you know, trying to... God brings us, whether we think it's of our own will, and, and it is, you, you come, but God knows and God draws. But here, this verse says that God places us 
in the body. Right? God places each member of this body, each one of them in the body, just as he desires. If they were all one member, there would be, where would the body be? Uh, but now there are many members, but one body, and the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the member of the body which seems to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, of these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas uh, our more presentable members have no need of it. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there would be no division in the body, but that the member, members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. And you can keep going on and on and on and so God is always about his body and remember his body isn't just little Calvary Chapel to Hatchby right his body is huge it's global right but we all are in a single body which Christ is the head and what an amazing thing that God places us in the body and I say this often and I believe it with all my heart Sometimes we come to a church and we think that, it, and it's not because we have a guest here, <laughs> but, but sometimes we think we come to the church because we need something from that church. And hopefully if they're preaching the word of God and the spirit of God is there, you know, they need God. Uh, but really, oftentimes, myself included, when I first came to this church, that's kind of how I thought, you know, 15, 14 years ago. But really, when I begin to understand that it's not so much about what I need from this body, it's what does this body need from me, right? If I take God at his word and, and say that God placed me here and he placed me here with a purpose and he gave me a gift to edify this whole body, then it's not just about me. Whatever God has given me to use here is to edify others, the whole body. And it really begins to change your idea. That's why I love David. Uh, when David, you know, was talking about how we don't have a lot of kids here and him and his wife are kind of looking for a church where there's, you know, more kids but then he said that God just convicted him and he said, you know what, maybe we need to be here because they need kids. And, you know, I was just like, you got it. You know, you got it. God brought you here because what God has given you, he wants you to share with everyone else. And sometimes it's, it's this body needs you, right? I mean, I've argued that with uh, lone, lone Ranger Christians who think, you know, they can be Christians, but not fellowship in, in the body. And that's dangerous. You know, and I get it. Some people have been burned by churches and this and that, or had splits, and they just think that the church is a mess. Well, guess what? Jesus doesn't give up on the church. The church is Jesus's, and the gates of hell will not prevail. But a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, it's people seeing that maybe they're the piece that that church needs to plug into that body. And that, when you begin to see it that way, you know, not saying God can't take us other places, he can, but it's all about God wanting us to grow where we're planted. God may have us here for a month or a year or 10 years or 50 years, who knows? But to grow where you were planted and to serve within that body, why? So that you can benefit? No, so that others can benefit because that's what our gifts are. They are to benefit others. They're not to necessarily benefit us, right? They're to benefit others. And so what an amazing thing here, though, this idea of unity. And why I say that? Because here we go, chapter 32. We'll get into a little bit of this. I went way too long already. But we'll get into this since I opened the door. Chapter 32, verse 1 says, Now the sons of Reuben and the sons of Gad had exceedingly large numbers of livestock, so when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that is what was indeed a place suitable for livestock, the sons of Gad and the sons of Reuben came and spoke to Moses and to Eleazar the priest and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, uh, Atroth, Dibon, Jazer, Nimrah, 
Heshbon, uh, Elia, Sebem, Nebo, and Bion, the land which the Lord conquered before the congregation of Israel is the land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. They said, if we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us across the Jordan. Uh, remember, they are now maybe months away from entering into the promised land. And here's the picture now. God has uh, contained and cared for these million plus people right, for 40 years. Right? That original generation we just read a couple weeks ago has died off because they didn't trust God. They didn't take the land. When God says, go take the land, they sent the spies in and they were afraid and so they didn't take possession of the land. That's why God says, okay, you're going to spend 38 years now because that was about at the two-year period when God gave them the land, but because of their lack of faith, God turned them back and made them wander in the wilderness to teach them and to wait for that generation that wasn't faithful to die in the wilderness so that the new generation, uh, led by Caleb and Joshua, could inherit the promised land. So remember, we're looking at that new generation. And now we're at the end of that 40 years. And they're getting ready to enter into the promised land in these two tribes who are two of the wealthier tribes who had a lot of livestock. They come to Moses and they say, hey, you know what? Uh, the land over here that we've already conquered, man, it's perfect for livestock. And we got a lot of livestock. You know what? Uh, we don't need the promised land. Uh, this land is perfect for us. How about we just inherit this land and don't bother entering into the promised land? And to me, it's just amazing to hear this. Right again, because you had this solid group that moved through the wilderness, that was delivered from Egypt, that uh, each of the tribes had specific jobs and duties within the congregation or the nation of Israel. And now here you have two tribes of the 12, right? Two of the 12 tribes. So it's a significant number of people that are saying, nah, you know, we don't want to enter into the promised land. We found what we're looking for right here, right here in the wilderness. And really, it's a sad, sad thing because for 40 years or thereabouts, this was the dream. Uh, this was their goal. Uh, this was the, you may say, the end or the beginning of the promise of God. This is what Abraham, 400 years earlier, was promised. And so think of all those generations before this generation that taught their kids and, and lived with this expectation of, expectation of one day we're going to get there. One day my kids as kids as kids as kids, my seventh generation grandchildren are going to live in the land that God promised us. 400 years. Now this generation that is there, they, they themselves, at least 40 years, they were little kids when they were in the wilderness. They saw what happened to their parents, their grandparents. And here they are now, ready to enter into the promised land. And what do they do? They don't want to enter into the promised land. They found what they were looking for. Why? Because they had a lot of cattle. And they found some fertile land. But didn't God say, I have a better land for you? Didn't he say it was a land flowing with milk and honey? Didn't God already prove to them how good he was, how faithful he was? Why would they think that what they had right there in the wilderness was going to be better and more suitable for them than what God promised them? Well, may I say it's because they're doing the same thing that their fathers did. Their fathers didn't believe. They didn't trust God. After all the years of evidence of God proving himself to be faithful, now here they come and they say, we don't want to enter in. And guys, that's why I said at the very beginning, it's a sad, sad thing. Uh, when somebody gets saved, right? And we can say, well, were they really saved or not? You know what? That's God's business. And that's the individual's business. But when somebody gets saved and professes Christ, but then doesn't choose to pursue the life of Christ, doesn't pursue anything, doesn't desire the gifts, doesn't maybe even believe. Some churches don't even believe in the gifts of the Spirit, right? Because some churches go a little haywire with it and give it a bad name, right? And pervert the Spirit of God, and that's not okay either. 
But people stop short of what God has planned for their lives. Maybe it's because, hey, I got a pretty comfortable job. You know, I got a pretty comfortable this and that. I don't really want to stir the pot. I don't, you know, we got a good thing going. In other words, we're becoming complacent. This is the picture. Uh, they knew what they had right there, right? I don't want to take this step of faith. And uh, Maybe they even said, you know what, I'm done fighting. I mean, how many wars has this God taken us through? I'm done fighting. I just want to stop and I want to settle here. Has any of you ever said that? Man, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of all this spiritual stuff. I mean, why am I, why am I being attacked? Right? Why is it so difficult to resist the flesh why is it so difficult to resist the devil? Why doesn't this carnal man that I am, is still part of me, uh, why isn't he completely dead? Why does he keep raising his ugly head? I'm tired of this fight. It's so much easier, we think, right? It's so much easier to just stop fighting. Just give in. I'm not going anywhere anyways. We're not getting anywhere. This is where they're at. We're just going to be content right here. We're going to settle up outside of God's promise. Well, I've learned this personally that you're never going to be content outside of God's will. You're never going to find the peace you're looking for. You're never going to find the rest. You're never going to find the end of that spiritual battle either outside of the will of God. Our best chance is being in the center of God's will and pursuing God's will. So these people don't even want to inherit this 400 year promise. Think of how the generations before, if their ancestors could talk to them, <laughs> they'd probably whip their behinds. What are you talking about, boy? I sacrificed my whole life in anticipation for you to inherit this promise, and now you only want it? Now you're just going to let it sit there? You know, talk about letting a lot of your, your generations down for sure. Plus, what are they missing out on? What are they missing out on? They're the ones that lose. They're the ones that are going to lose. So how does Moses respond to this? Look at this, verse 6. But Moses said to the sons of Gad and to the sons of Reuben, Shall your brothers go to war while you yourselves sit here? I love this. Remember, we're, we're an army. We're a group together. We're one body. We need you. You're taking a couple hundred thousand people away from our military. Uh, remember the goal that we're all on? We have one singular goal and, and one focus and one purpose. Now you're breaking ranks. Now you're, you're making everyone else vulnerable. Now you're making our military less weak. Now we're going to go in there. Well, you sit here because you already inherited your promise, land, you're letting your people down. This is where Moses is upset. Moses says, what about your brothers? You're going to let your brothers go in there and fight without you now? Will you sit here and cozy up outside of the promise of God? Moses is a pretty smart guy. He says, now why are you, here it is, discouraging the sons of Israel from crossing over into the land which the Lord had given them? See, you want to just lay down and, and make your bed and lie in it, fine. But what you're doing right here is you are now discouraging the rest of the people. That's what he just said. You are discouraging the sons of Israel from wanting to cross over into the promised land, the 400-year promise. You're affecting your brothers, your people, your countrymen because of your lack of faith, because your complacency. Because you found a little piece of something you think is, you know, going to make you happy, make you successful. You're, you're, you're hurting your brothers. You're discouraging. And isn't discouragement, I think that's why I said it earlier, you know, discouragement is dangerous. It's very dangerous because it's contagious. This is what Moses knows. The discouragement of these two tribes and not wanting to enter into the promise of God began to infiltrate the rest of the nation. This is what Moses was concerned about. And I think sometimes we're drawn more to discouragement. You know, I think sometimes it's easier to rest in discouragement than to keep believing and trusting and hoping in Christ. 
it's easier to just look around and be discouraged because pff, I can find discouragement everywhere I look. But faith now, faith is a little harder to find, isn't it? Faith is a little harder to live by. But discouragement, boy, I can find plenty of, you know, fuel for my discouragement. And I find little groups that I can hang out with where we begin to encourage each other in discouragement. <laughs> That's all we do is we sit around and we discourage each other. Right? This is the picture of these two tribes because of their lack of faith. And so Moses calls them out and he says here, verse 8, he says, this is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnina to Bar Barnea to see the land. For when they went up to the valley of Ishkol and saw the land, they discouraged the sons of Israel so that they did not go into the land which the Lord had given them. So the Lord's anger burned in that day, and he swore, saying, None of the men who came up from Egypt from 20 years old and upward shall see the land which I swore to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, for they did not follow me fully, except Caleb, the son of Jephunel, and Kenizzite, the Kenizzite, and Joshua, the son of Nun, for they have followed the Lord fully. So the Lord's anger burned against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation of those who had done evil in the sight of the Lord was destroyed. Now behold, you have risen up in your father's place, a brood of sinful men to add still more to the burning anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once more abandon them in the wilderness and you will destroy all of these people. Moses levies a pretty stern warning, right? That's what he's doing here. He's saying, look, you're doing, you can paint it however you want and you're gonna be happy with this little land and your livestock, but what you're doing, because remember we're one, we're not, think about this, none of us are an island, are we? We're all connected whether we wanna be or not. Uh, even in the human sense, right? We're not an island. What you do affects people, especially in a home, especially in a church where you are one. What we do matters. And so this is what Moses is saying. Look, you're doing the same thing your fathers did. And remember, God was not pleased. God didn't say, yay, you know, okay, you know, you want to just take your own land? You know, you don't want my promise? Okay, be blessed. No, God said, you know what? You want this land that bad? Then you know what? You're going to die in this land. You're not going to enter in my promise. You're not going to be blessed. And so God turned them away. And this is what Moses is saying. Look, God, don't be fooled, right? Don't, don't think somehow you got the e-ticket to heaven because your fathers were disobedient that now somehow you just, you're going to enter in and you don't need to worry about anything. Moses says, you're doing the same thing they're doing. And so don't be fooled thinking you're going to be blessed and live happy and find what you're looking for. No, you're going to be sent back to the wilderness. And you are going to take all of Israel with you if you keep discouraging the people. It's exactly what happened before. And this is what Moses says, verse 14 is where we close. Because he says, Now behold, you have risen up in your father's place, a brood of sinful men, to add still more to the burning anger of the Lord against Israel. For if you turn away from following him, he will once more abandon them in the wilderness and you will destroy all of these people. What a sad, sad thing. You're going to do exactly what your fathers did. You know, Proverbs 1 says this about discouragement and how we need to be careful that we aren't breeding discouragement and causing people to uh, stop trusting God or, or to stop walking by faith or to stop you know, falling in love with God. Proverbs 132 says, The waywardness of the naive will kill them, listen to this, and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Right? Scary. And so... 
Romans, this is where we close, close. Paul says this because Israel, even to this day, kind of falls into this trap where they don't trust God. And God does what? Sends them back to the wilderness. Well, Paul says this in Romans. This is fascinating to me. Romans chapter 11, at verse 25, Paul writes this. He says, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. We talked about that a couple Sundays ago. Because of the tendency and the nature of the Jewish people. In the Old Testament, that generation we just read about refused to trust God and believe God and inherit the promised land, so God turned them back to the wilderness. In more recent times, the promised land came through Jesus Christ Himself. He was the promised one. Right? He was their Messiah. And God sent him into the world. And what did Israel do? Remember, Jesus went to the Jews, his own people, who should have known about Jesus. Remember, there were prophecies given, especially in Daniel, fascinating prophecy, where the exact day that their Messiah was going to be born was given. Right? So Israel was without excuse. You see, we don't have a prophecy looking forward of when the return of Jesus will come. We don't have that. But Israel should have known the day of their visitation. That's why Jesus wept. But they didn't. So they rejected the Messiah. So what did God do? Well, Paul just said it right here. God basically turned them back to the wilderness. They didn't receive their Messiah. So God did a partial hardening, right? Or you may say sent them back to the wilderness until what? The fullness of the Gentiles come in. The church. That's what we talked about. Until God is done with his work through the church, the Gentiles, and we are raptured out of here, or whatever your theology is, but when God's work with the church is done, then God will turn back, is what he's going to say, verse 26. And so all of Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Here you go, verse 28. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. Interesting. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. I love that. And we should all be thankful for that, right? That the gifts and the call of God is irrevocable. Verse 30. For just as once you were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, speaking of Israel, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. I love God. God's considering the whole. Remember, we're talking about this. The whole group, right? Right? God has a plan and a purpose for Israel. He has a plan and a purpose for the church. But we'll remember, we are all one at the end of the day. Right? They, because of their rejection, it opened the door for us. And now because of what we're doing and being shown mercy, it opens the door for them. God is amazing. Right? We're not islands. We're not independent. We're codependent on Christ Jesus himself. Verse 32 says, For God has shut up all in disobedience so that he may show mercy to all. What an amazing, amazing thing. And so uh, next week we'll look at this a little more because uh, he not only says, Look, this is what your fathers did, uh, but he also says, You know, um, you need to think about what you're doing. Because there's going to be consequences. I wanted to get into Matthew 25, but we will next week. This idea of complacency. And they just thought that they could just take their ease, take their land. They don't want to fight anymore. They don't want to, you know, the struggle of the promised land is too much. We just want to be content right here, outside of God's will. Well, remember, Jesus warns us about that in Matthew 25, 14 through 30, when he talks about the talents. 
And remember the master or the owner of the land um, gave each of his servants talents or gifts or abilities uh, or resources. And he gave them to them and said, hey, look, take these and use them. And when I come back, I'm going to account for what you did with what I gave you, right? So the landowner went away, and what happened? Well, one of the slaves or servants went and took those five talents, I think it was, and uh, put it to use and gained another five. And uh, so when his master returned, that one, he says, hey, well done, good, good and faithful servant, right? Uh, you took what I gave you and, and you used it, right? You used it for my kingdom, for my glory, to edify and build up the body of Christ, yada, yada, yada. Well done, good and faithful servant. What about the servant with two, right? That was given two which is a good picture too. Some are given five, some are given two. It's as God wills. God wills as he gives, right? Just like in 1 Corinthians 12, when it says that the Spirit is the one that distributes as he wills, right? So you aren't to argue over who has the five or two or one or 30 or million, right? God distributes them. We're just supposed to be faithful in using them for his glory and for his kingdom. So remember the last slave that was given whatever it was, one or two, and remember, that slave was fearful, the Bible said. And so he went and he took it and he buried it. You know, thinking it was just going to be safe. Well, maybe you can roll that into the story here tonight. Maybe he became complacent. Maybe he didn't want to do anything with what God had given him. He just kind of took it and punched his e-ticket and he's just going to wait, you know, for whatever his theology is. Either he dies and ends up in the presence of the Lord or the rapture or the tribulation period. The point is... He didn't do anything. He didn't make his life useful. He didn't make uh, uh, his gifts and his talents that were given to him useful for the kingdom. He just kind of, maybe you can say like these guys, didn't really want the fullness of Christ, didn't really want to, you know, be used by Christ in in some special way for the benefit of others. (laughs) Usually that's what holds us back, self, right? What's in it it for me? Well, you know, what am I going to get out of the deal? No, you know then go live in your your land outside of the will of God, right? And find your peace and your joy that you will not find. But what an amazing thing. He came back to that one and the one was fearful and he just hit it. And what did the landlord say? Did he say, ah, it's okay, you know, that's all right. Just come on in, you know, everything's fine. No, he actually had some pretty harsh words. He said, you lazy and wicked slave. Right? I think he even says something about, you know, take this one and throw him out and take what he does have and give it to the rest and divide it up. And, you know, God cares. You know, he wants us to trust him and believe him. And, and what did Caleb and Joshua, what was accredited to them? Though the other ones didn't, you know, fully follow the Lord, what did Joshua and Caleb do? They fully followed the Lord. That means they loved the Lord, their God, with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love their neighbor as they love themselves. Right? All in. All in. And if we don't want all in, you know, there's some pretty strange stories that kind of, I believe, are there uh, for our example to, to, to maybe wake us up and say, well, you know, maybe, maybe I should pursue God more. Maybe I, I should trust Him more. Maybe I should walk more by faith. Right? Because that's all we can try to do is stir up of the spirit that is in all of us. Stir it up to those good works, right? To encourage us in the works, not to discourage, right? I, God forbid I would never stand up before God's church and God's people and give a message of discouragement. <laughs> when we serve a God that Jeremiah 29, 11 says, look, I know the plans I have for you. God knows his plans for us. The problem is we don't know them. And we could be discouraged when we don't begin to see them. But God knows the plans he has towards us. Are they evil? Are they to harm us? Are they for our good? Right? To bless us along the way. It's an amazing thing. And so let's pray here tonight and we'll get into uh, the rest of the chapter next week and Um, this Sunday, look forward to the message as well. Father in heaven, I just thank you, God, for your word, and I thank you for these chapters, God, as I can just see myself so much in 
these two tribes, Lord, that just were done fighting maybe or were tired of fighting or you know they didn't want to have to live by faith anymore and trusting. They wanted to just take what they could see and, and be comfortable there. And it's very tempting. It's very tempting because it, it appeals to our nature. It appears, appeals to our flesh, but I'm reminded of what John says in John, I think it's chapter 6, uh, that says the Spirit um, profits everything, but it's the flesh that profits nothing. And so, Father, help us to remember that. It, it says that it, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. And Jesus said, the words I have spoken are spirit and life, but they are, um, but there are still some who won't believe. And so that's us, God. The flesh profits nothing, and yet it's it's so much easier to just give the flesh what the flesh wants. Uh, but we know what your word says in Galatians five, that if we walk in the spirit, we will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. But if we walk in the flesh, we will not satisfy the desires of the Spirit. So, Father, help us. Help each and every one of us, Lord, as we struggle daily at times, God, to keep fighting the good fight, Lord, the fight of faith, and to keep walking by faith and keep uh, being encouraged through your word, God. The story for us as Christians, let me remind you, it ends well. Uh, it ends well. And so for that and that alone, we should be able to take a little bit of encouragement and to keep uh, pursuing uh, a deeper relationship with you that we may know the height and the breadth and the width and the depth of your great love for each and every one of us. And so, Father, bless us as we go. Keep us safe. Watch over us. I do pray for all those who are struggling and suffering physically or emotionally, spiritually, financially, Lord, whatever the needs are. Father, I pray that as we ask and we come to you, Lord, that you would meet these needs, that you would... Fulfill your promises in our lives as we cling to those promises, as we pray those promises over ourselves and our church and our family. And so, Lord, bless us as we go. We thank you again, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. For a second there, I thought we were going to have a title of the sermon, Ask Not What Your Church Can Do For You, but What, your, but you, what you Can Do For Your Church. <laughs> right, please stand. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can feel the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. I can feel His mighty power and His grace. I can hear the brush of angels' wings. I see glory on each face. Surely the presence the Lord is in this place. Surely in the presence of the Lord is in this place. Be blessed in your coming and your going, and we'll hopefully see you on Sunday.